Hello everybody, it is me, Liquid Kitten, and I have a guest here. This is Headless97, I have returned. Excellent. Um, and you'll notice um, we're fighting bots, and that's just because uh, we didn't really have anything to put in the background. Um, and we didn't also want to, we also didn't want to get distracted <laughs> by... And we didn't want to piss off a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're just going to put some random bot stuff in the background. You will notice... Uh, Shikigami-chan um, is not a bot. Um, they're not going to be joining us in voice chat because they're not part of the interview, but it is a buddy of mine and one of our subscribers. Um, and yeah, so this beautiful individual. And we are speaking today in an interview format with uh, Mr. Headless here <clears throat> about the current affair of $60 full release titles. Um, it was requested by a subscriber by the name of OneHammer. Um, I believe. I hope. I hope I got that right. I should have wrote that down. I feel like an idiot. Um, uh, he mentioned something on our Skyrim video. So. Yeah, we never pass up a chance to rip on games. <laughs> that is what we do. Um, I've also never played Vi or V before. So this will be interesting. Okay. Buy some stuff. So, All right. yeah, I actually had the uh, the interesting pleasure of going back to the mall and going into a GameStop. I was looking for some PlayStation 3 games, and then I remembered why I'm a PC gamer, because I couldn't find anything there that actually interested me. Go ahead and run top with me. Or bottom, or yeah, yeah, top's fine. That's fine. And also, um, it was quite nice knowing now I don't have to go into GameStop ever again, really. I can sit down, I can order all my games from home. And they arrive instantly, digitally. Better than mail. Um, uh, so let's see. So, here is... He sent GLHF over the phone to me. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> sorry. So let's get on to question number one. So <clears throat> it seems like lately there are a lot of games that are coming out, uh, $60 titles, that have one of two major problems with them that I'm noticing. And that is Dead Space 3. Um, where it is a good game. Um, I'm hearing lots of good stuff about it. I'm definitely going to be playing it um, once I get through the other uh, two Dead Spaces. I've got a very late start on those. Go ahead and get Last Hits, too. Um, and and um, what I'm noticing is in the industry, there is a lot of problems where... Thank you. Um, where, where there are other releasing titles that are very buggy, um, which I would see as obviously like a, a direct problem. Or they're releasing titles that are going for this, I want to say, <laughs> Diablo 3-esque idea, since I feel like they're the first big $60 title that has done this, where you pay for the game, and then they give you a cash shop. And um, so I guess we should probably tackle this one by one. So go ahead and... Whichever one you, whichever one you want to speak about first. Well... Diablo 3 came first with that, so I think that's really important to touch on. Uh, Activision likes to uh, likes to set examples for the industry to follow, I've noticed. Uh, Activision and EA are kind of the big ones with that. They did it with the online passes. So, you know, you had to put in uh, basically a CD key in order to access certain content of the game, just to prove that you actually bought it. Um, but when it comes to... <coughs> Excuse me. All right. When it comes to buying a game and then having a cash shop in there, I really think that's the, the territory of free-to-play games. Mm -hmm. You get the game for free, and then you can spend money in there. What they're doing is they're trying to encourage people to not play the game. You know, basically, life isn't about getting to the end. It's not about winning. It's not about finishing it or having the best. It's about the journey and the experience. And what you're doing is you are buying no experience. 
yes. you're paying for the opportunity to not play the game that you just spent sixty dollars on. So I can't imagine why consumers would want to do it. But it, it seems really counterintuitive to me from a consumer standpoint. Yes, and I agree. Um, would you say, um, real fast, just set, try to segue these together, do you feel like that is the same kind of problem as having... Um, yeah, Total, Total Biscuit. I'm sure a lot of people uh, are aware of him. Uh, I, he had an opinion where he was talking about how you know, when when a game is released, it should not have DLC right away. You know, obviously, because if they're spending time making the game, um, um, first day DLC shouldn't be anything but, like, cosmetics. You know, fun things. Things that could be done while the game is, you know, being bug tested, um, you know, while they're finishing up, you know, different assets, stuff like that. So, like, maybe while the game's being play tested the sound guys can throw in, you know, like a, a funny little optional, you know, DLC you could get that changes the voice of somebody, you know, weird little things like that, costumes from the graphic people. Um, would you say that releasing a full title game and then having content in the game, especially from launch that you have to pay for, is similar um, in the sense that it you're paying for a full game, but they're purposely locking you out of it? Or, like, how do you feel about that kind of, like, do you think those are a similar kind of problem? Well, they are, in a way, a very similar problem. Anything that's made before the game is out should be in the game. I mean, there are some things, like the art team doesn't really have much to do at that point, so they can get started on the next DLC. But that's not going to be done for a while. If they're taking something off the game to sell later, mm -hmm. that's a big problem. And it happens. And people actually buy it. That's the thing that really gets to me. If they didn't buy it, it wouldn't succeed, and they wouldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Pretty much... Oh. Uh, companies are releasing $60 titles that are buggy and have problems, and they're only doing it more and more because people are still buying it. Yeah. Just like the uh, the sequel haven that we have right now where all the popular games are sequels, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have that if people bought original properties. Yeah, I definitely feel like 2012 was the year of sequels, and 2013 is looking like the year of trilogy. Yeah, definitely. But um, on the subject, yeah, it is basically the same thing. It's effectively double dipping and it's worse when the game suffers because of it i mean if you can release a great game and immediately have more great content for it that's one thing and i might even be more forgiving of the idea mm -hmm. but the fact that they're releasing broken buggy games on an annual basis and then immediately charging more money to get more out of the game i don't even have enough game to begin with the standards have really dropped in the last couple of years mm -hmm. Um, so obviously, um, when oh get out of there! <laughs> obviously, when it comes down to the subject of a multiplayer game that has um, content you can pay for, people can argue that it's pay to win, and that's usually what ends up being the big argument against the game is that it's pay to win like that. Now, in with a game like um, Dead Space Three, where it's a multiplayer sense of the game that it's co-op, um, you know, you're not going against other people in like a deathmatch style environment. Would you say that it's still detrimental to the community to allow you to buy power like that? I'd say it's detrimental in the long run. Uh, people might get used to it and they might accept it as normal mm -hmm. to be able to do that kind of thing. But it's, it's also that you're paying for something that used to be free. That's one thing we used to be able to cheat, put in our own codes, and we could have, you know the amazingly good weapons and stuff. And we could mod the games and get amazingly good weapons if we wanted to. Uh, you know, breaking the game was our own decision, effectively. Exactly. Um, um, but having the developer encourage that yes. is really, really not something I would want to support. And it is, it is different in a multiplayer environment because then it can become pay to win. Mm-hmm. But it is counter to the entire gameplay. I mean, if you're scavenging for items, you're trying to find the, the best gear to move forward. Or, you know, in Diablo 3, when you're gathering loot, that's that's the game. That's what action RPGs have always been, is getting loot. Mm -hmm. Oh, that hurt. Yeah, I saw that coming. I was like, oh, red beam, that looks nice. And then I died. <laughs> but, oh, uh, you know... 
Diablo 3 has it both in single player and the multiplayer with the item shop because they're, they don't want there to be a difference between the single player and the multiplayer. I think it's part of them wanting more control over their game. You know, when it goes out to the community and they get modding coming in, they can't really control that. And I think they're trying to get that same amount of this is our game, we'll play it our way in the single player game. So having the online passes so that you need to buy the game new and you need to go by their rules, etc. Mm -hmm. That's one method. And also having the in-game item shops. It's another way they're trying to basically keep it theirs. Make sure that everything goes through their channels. Yes. And they get paid for it. Um, do you think, so, um, jumping to the other side of the, of the, uh, question with the bugs, um, I've noticed that Assassin's Creed 3 seems to be a very bug-ridden game. Um, there, I, there are a few channels that I watch that, um, showcase, um, you know, comedic bugs and weird glitches and that kind of stuff. Um, and it seems like after Assassin's 3, as, after Assassin's 3, was officially released, a very large percentage of their videos have actually been bugs from Assassin's Creed. Um, now, obviously, nobody ever wants to buy a full game that is also buggy because you know you're putting money down and you're you're getting a pro you're getting a product you probably won't enjoy. Um, I mean, you might, but not not as fully as you could if they had debugged first. Um, or at least caught all these things. And it's not even that they're small bugs. Um, most of them are graphic, um, definitely. They're not, like, game-breaking any, in any way. Um, but altogether, I mean, they're annoying um, when, it, when you come from a standpoint of wanting um, quality. Do you... I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I don't think you're going to be like, well, I think that's awesome. Because, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, that's just it's, overall... It's obviously kind of, wrong. Yeah. But, I mean, how does that make you feel? Like, what what do you think is going on in the industry that's causing games to come out like this? Do you think that it is um, a pressure to release things fast? Um, or do you think that it is more of a problem of companies nowadays, just maybe... I, I really think it's actually a problem with the communities, that people are willing to accept it. They often like to use the excuse... You know, companies exist to make money. That this is okay because the company is just trying to make money. Mm -hmm. and this is a way to do it. Yes. As if the ends justify the means in that regard. And really, they don't. People should have very high standards, especially when we're talking about companies that know nothing about games and don't care about them. They listen to their market researchers and their investors. Mm -hmm. That's what they know that's what they care about. They don't care about the actual quality of the game. So they will release something on an annual basis because it sells more copies every single year. Why would they ever stop? Why would they care about the quality of the game in terms of quality assurance and innovation when people buy it anyway? Yes, I think that's definitely a problem <clears throat> when you look at... Um, I, I, I would argue that um, Square Enix is falling into that a little bit with Final Fantasy 13, You know, um, they released a bad game. Uh, a lot of people would agree that Final Fantasy 13 is not good, especially when you compare it to the rest of the IP and the franchise and how all those games were. Yet, obviously, they must have sold enough to warrant them continuing to make it. Um, do you think that there should be a point in time where a developer should... Do, do you think the fact that there's so much bad publicity for these games, yet developers are still making them, um, would you put any fault on the developer? Or would you say that it's, that it's really, truly just the community's fault since, you know, obviously enough of them bought it to warrant it, and the, and the, and the developer's just doing what they think, you know, we want by numbers? Well, the developer and the, the publisher definitely do have fault in there. They are the ones that are making bad games. I wonder often if they truly are proud of what they have released. Mm -hmm. And actually, I got a bit of um, an opinion on that from the one of the lead designers or publishers or creative people from EA or DICE, whoever was involved with Medal of Honor Warfighter. They said they were genuinely happy with the game and thought it was a very good game, but it was received poorly. Yes. And ev everyone hated it. It's considered one of the worst games of the year. 
by so many people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if Square Enix genuinely thought Final Fantasy XIII was a great game. I understand that it's like a 60-hour campaign that ends on a cliffhanger, which isn't exactly appealing, and that they intended to sell story-based DLC. I think you should end the story if you put that much time into it. Yes. Um, one thing um, that I think is pretty ridiculous is if you remember um, f with um, f Mass Effect 3, where um, e it wasn't endgame, um, it wasn't uh, they wanted you to buy more storyline stuff later, and I have noticed that quite a bit, um, although it's usually with games that are less story-driven, um, arguably, in the sense of, you know, like Borderlands or... Um, things like that. I think Dishonored plans on doing something similar, though. Um, they they're, they plan on releasing storyline DLC later. Um, but, you know, uh, Mass Effect was released, and they, on launch, had DLC that you had to buy that would completely change the game, in the sense of you could have... Um, oh, people are going to kill me now for, for not remembering what they're called. Like the Forerunners or something like that, or the... Uh, I believe it was Prometheans. Prometheans, yes, that is, that that's the word that's going for. I'm amazed um, I remembered that, considering I played maybe ten minutes of the first game. <laughs> um, yeah, which which is which is quite funny because I played I played a lot of a, uh, a lot of that game. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted for a second there. Um, yeah, trying to make I'm, sure I'm trying I don't... to figure out this character and commentate at the same time. For those of you who don't know, I just kind of got into League of Legends. I haven't spent any actual money. I'm still trying to find characters that I like, and though I have characters that I like, I'm kind of hellbent on not spending money, because <laughs> I'm cheap. <laughs> I'm going to try to build up enough in-game points to actually buy someone. But that's going to take a while, because all the guys I like are really expensive. Luckily, doing random crap like this, though, is going to help you do that. Which is one thing I do like about League of Legends, is I feel like they're really fair um, with their model, in the sense that even if you just want to dick around with some friends fighting bots and stuff, they still don't, you know, they still don't mind giving you points for it. It's just not as much as you would get if you were um, playing the game with people. Um, um, but, <laughs> back to the topic, because I feel like this game's going to not be too much longer, um, since we have three... Well, since we have two veterans, um, and, and also you playing against just some bots. Um, so, as we've, so just to recap real fast, since <laughs> we kind of have three different conversations going on at once. Um, you know, obviously, uh, no argument, games being released in these, in, the, in these buggy states is just not good. And it's a sign that, um, you know, as, as players, we need to, um, or as consumers, I should say, um, we should probably... I would say wait until first impressions, um, videos, and you know reviews come out, and not not the ones that come out immediately, but you know the ones that come out you know a little while after launch, um, you know like the YouTube interview, um, the YouTube reviews and stuff like that, because they will bring up bugs. Um, you know, don't go to just big sites like Metacritic and stuff like that that um, can easily con be convoluted um, and just look at their day one scores and then go, all right, well, you know, I'm obviously buying it. That's good. Um, or this is a bad game. I'm not going to buy it. Because it can be all kinds of messed up in that game. Um, or in, <laughs> in that uh, in that review. But the, the point um, we, you know, we came down to was that overall this is just bad business practice. Um, and that it's the consumer and the publisher and the developer's fault all together. We all need to work together to stop games from coming out like this by stop buying titles at $60 release um, after we hear bad things about them. And the, the, uh, the um, Alien Colonial Marines thing has been the biggest. Um, a bunch of people pre-ordered it, and they're still pre-ordering it, I believe. Um, but supposedly it's supposed to have a lot of stuff wrong with it. Sadly, I don't know too many details on this subject because it's just recent information. But supposedly that game's getting railed pretty hard for just having issues. Um, and a bunch of people have, you know, have already bought it, and I believe it's a March release. Um, Actually, um, I know that Aliens Colonial Marines is out. It was one that initially I was excited about, and then they had a gameplay trailer, which solidified the fact that I don't want to play the game. Mm -hmm. 
uh, oh, because it okay. looked really generic. Okay, well, I'm glad you brought that up, because I was a little confused. For some reason, I thought that it was being released next month and all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, is that also the game? that? And this is just overall wrong. I'm just going to bring this up to, to name and shame a company. But um, I heard from Total Business Channel that when they made the original trailer um, to hype the game when it was announced, um, after they had been working on it, they actually not only um, made the trailer completely out of the game's engine, um, but they made it also 100% unrepresentative of the real game. They, perp they, they basically almost admittedly came out and said that they just made a, a, a similar lore-based movie to impress people about the world, but not to actually have anything to do with the game. Well, there are some ways in which I can appreciate having a trailer. It's like, uh, this is what we want the game to be. Mm -hmm. But that's something that you do early in development. You know, um, you know, the kind of teaser trailer sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Where you say, this is, this is what we think the game will be. Like, um, if you go to... Let's go way back in time. Let's go to the original Dawn of War, mm -hmm. the Warhammer 40,000 game. When you start the game, it has this intro. It's basically an action movie, and I think it's pretty cool. It's not really representative of the gameplay in any real respect, mm -hmm. but it is cool to watch, and it does get me excited to play the game. And that's more than okay. You can have that for a trailer, things like that. I don't know if that was in engine. It was. I know it was all pre-rendered stuff, but I don't know if they actually used their game engine or if it's just animated. I have no idea. But you should not be creating something to deliberately deceive your consumers. Mm -hmm. Often, when the uh, when developers and publishers release screenshots, they might, you know, go back through and, and Photoshop it and edit it a bit to make it more color saturated to make it appear more vibrant and more alive and actually make it look better than it actually looks mm -hmm. and that's really deceptive it's something that we should actively fight against i don't know how other than to say I actually send them letters describing what they're doing and you know saying how we feel about it because if you pirate the game they're just going to say oh pc gamers are pirates Mm -hmm. If you don't buy the game, they'll say they don't want this. If you wait, they might think they value it less, but they won't understand why. Yeah. Uh, right now, all publishers seem to want is their own Call of Duty or their own Battlefield 3, the game that comes out, sells a bajillion copies on the first day, and that's it. I, I feel like um, the whole pirating and... Um, peace and no love for PC thing. It's kind of a self-fulfilling um, thing in the sense that um, people, I don't know what started it. I mean, I'm sure people have been pirating for a long time, but I mean, I don't know what game started the big pirate fiasco or if it was a game or, or exactly what originated it. But I feel like what's happening, at least right now, is a company releases a bad game. People pirate that game because the company decides to release it for a price that is not becoming of the actual quality of the game. And people don't want to support that, but they want to, you know, but th maybe, maybe, you know, I have this sometimes where there's a, um, a game that maybe necessarily I don't want to play, or, you know, I don't want to support, but I, I still want to play the game. And so I go buy the game because I don't pirate. But um, I could see somebody who doesn't have a moral standpoint on that, being like, well, I don't want to support them for making that bad game, but I'd still rather play it than not. And so they pirate the game. Then the PC community turns around, or um, the, the, the PC developer, the studios turn around, and they go, well, look, we released the game, and people bought it, but like a bunch of people, a bunch of people pirated it. Um, so why would we spend time making a good game if you just didn't get pirated? And so then they make more crap, which is then pirated more. Um, and so what ends up happening is both sides want the other one to change first, but neither side will change because they're blaming the other side for their problem. And do you feel like um, both sides need to change at one time, or is there a side that's kind of more at fault here and should step up their game? Well, I also don't really know the origin. I know there came a point in time when developers and publishers decided that the 
piracy had reached such a rate, such an amount, that it wasn't worth it, that they needed to start putting in DRM in order to make a profit from their games. I do think that there needs to be more open communication, that without that, both sides are going to be very suspicious of the other side, mm -hmm. because these are two worlds that do not understand each other at all. At all. I have, we have no idea what goes into the game making process from development standpoints and from business standpoints. We, we just have no idea. All we have is our perspective of wanting to play great games and not be ripped off. Yeah. But it is kind of a, a catch-22. You know, they need to make a game that respects us as consumers. And as they're not doing that, we aren't giving them any respect as developers. Mm -hmm. um, not to jump off track, especially since I this is really getting close to the end, but um, kind of on the lines of that, um, the 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 makers of Dead Space Three said that when the port is, you know, when they when they're releasing this game, um. If I remember correctly, um, the they said that they didn't want to spend the time to unlock the higher quality textures and to add in a field of view slider and all that stuff because they felt that it was unfair to give the PC community a better product just because they have a superior machine. Um, that if people are paying the same price for the same game that they should get the same exact experience. Do you agree with that? Absolutely not. That would be like porting a game over to the Wii U and not doing anything with it to make it work on the console. I mean, there are some ways that you shouldn't phone in, you know, touchscreen controls, but, you know, the game doesn't have the graphical prowess uh, for, you know, when the next gen comes around, because it's about equal to the Xbox right now. But you're not taking advantage of its strengths. Mm -hmm. It's like... It would be like if you were to put a game on the Xbox and not have it be able to use the uh, the center home button to bring up the dashboard. It, it does, doesn't work with the console. Yeah. You have, if you're going to put a game on PC, you're going to suffer the disadvantages of, you know, the piracy rate and things like that. You should also, you know, play to its advantages. It is a stronger, more powerful platform. It does have, you know, the digital distribution platform. These are things that you should play up to and really work with. You can make a game better. It, I think I think it was Total Biscuit who was talking about it who really said it best. And you compare it to uh, the generation gap in consoles when a new console comes out. The game Gun is an old Western shooter kind of game. It came out both on the Xbox and the Xbox 360. And it was a better game on the Xbox 360 because they were using the graphical prowess of the console. I think I remember him mentioning that, yeah. That he had bought it previously on the older console, and then when he realized it was on both, he bought it again on the 360 and thought it was amazing. And it actually caused him to um, to enjoy the game more. And other games that have gone backwards, like when the Xbox 360 and PS3 became more prominent and the PlayStation 2 was still around, and games would be ported back down to it, that those games had disadvantage. They weren't as graphically intense. They didn't have all the nice features that the higher-end version had. Could you imagine if they had toned it down so that the PlayStation 2 owners could get the same great experience as people that own the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3? <laughs> yeah. That they kept it at PS2 graphics levels so that they would all get the same experience? They wouldn't do that. I just see that as a lazy excuse. Mm -hmm. A really lazy excuse. I, I agree on that completely. Um, we might have to... I know you have some stuff going on today, so you might have to um, do like a second part of this <laughs> when there's time. Um, just so we can touch on all the subjects. Because I feel like right now we're basically going to end up leaving it at a point where we've made opinions and we haven't formed one, you know, closing statement about anything. Um... um yeah, no, I agree completely on that. I feel like, right now, to recap for the viewers, 
triple A companies, um, and hopefully in the second part of the interview, um, we can touch more on indies. Um, though I'll have to do a little more research because I haven't seen any big release issues on indies that I know of. Um, actually, no, I can think of a couple. I can think of a couple right now. Um, basically, and I'm speaking to the viewers right now, um, if you if you agree with us, then what your point of view is, you know, your money's important to you. And dropping forty nine ninety nine to fifty nine ninety nine on a brand new AAA title that's either buggy, um, doesn't have all the content on release, and then asks you to pay for it, to pay for the the rest of the content, or releases a game, and then, you know, if you want to, basically what used to just be under a cheats menu, you know, they want you to pay money for stuff. Um, if if you don't agree with those things, you, you really should not be supporting it. A good way, I would say, to do that right now is probably, as much as it might pain us to do it, is to not pre-order things. Um, because you don't know what the game's going to be like when it's released. Uh, and, and if things keep going the way they are right now, we're not going to have... <laughs> there's not too much faith for a pre-order to come out and be a good game. Even if it's, a, even if it's an IP um, that we're super into, um, or a company we really trust, as um, we're starting to notice. And if we want things to start going in the right direction... We need to do one of two things, and both of which are pretty hard. The first thing is, as exciting as it is to buy a game on release, um, or to pre-order a game and get your fancy bonuses, um, and I and I'm right there with you. I am more than a, a I'm more I'm I'm a pretty impulse buy person myself. When a game comes out and I'm like, oh, I really want to play that, I am you know whip out the card, buy the game, and download it and play it um, before I do any research. And I think even if we just wait a couple days. Um, for some reviews to come out, you know, from the people that are going to play it real quick and get stuff out, even if they don't beat the whole game, um, for some more trusted YouTube channels, I would say, even more than some in the big media, um, just because I feel like this less ear pulling going on, um, and that's just my personal opinion, um, would be good, because if you get the 60 bucks in your pocket, and then a week later you find a review and the game is good, then you still have the 60 bucks to spend. If emergency came up and you need 60 bucks, well, you had it in your pocket, and if it turns out the game isn't good, or there's enough evidence shown to you that you don't want it, well, then you have $60 for another game. Um, and with the kind of sales Steam has, and with indies being so prevalent nowadays, you know, maybe that 60 bucks will get you more than a couple games. You can go out, you can get dinner, you can buy a couple indie games, and you can play all night. Um, but, um, and then when it comes to the crappy releases and ports, as the PC community... Um, Though I would say the it's a myth that PC gaming's dying. I mean that's just it, it's not true. Um, but if we want to have more attention given to us and we want more respect as a community, I definitely think we need to stop going with the pirate mentality of either um, well they treat us bad so I'm going to pirate it or um, I'll pirate it first and if I like it I'll buy it because truth is unless it's a multiplayer game um, if you pirate the game and then you really like it you're probably just going to keep playing it for free. Because why would you pay? Why would you take sixty bucks out of your pocket to buy a game you already got for free? Um, honestly, it's just. Uh, I mean, even if you have good intentions, it's just really easy to fall into that trap of well, I already have it. Um, and with the pirating, just because oh well, it's bad, I'll pirate it. As much as I'm pretty sure they can't get like really official numbers, how many copies have been pirated? It's not hard. Um, with how verbal, verbal people are nowadays for how much they don't like a game and how they pirate it and everything. So to at least get an idea of whether it's a game that's being highly targeted or not. And that's going to drive them away from us. And all we're going to have is bad ports um, and no attention. And then one of us has to budge. And sadly, I doubt it's going to be a developer. At least not a big one. Um, that's just... I feel like... To show that we're a mature community, and I've noticed that when I play on a console, there are lots of children on consoles um, compared to PC, by far. Um, especially, I mean, Call of Duty is, I think, the biggest example of that. Playing that with a microphone on a console, you, you get kids all the time. Constantly you get children, because their parents can just pop them in front of it and it babysits kids for them. Um, whereas on the computer, no one's going to go out and you know buy a really expensive computer just so their kids can play Call of Duty on the best settings. Um, so, long story short, um, and Headless can obviously talk um, in just a moment, uh, we need to take the first step 
because big businesses aren't going to do that for us. Um, and I will return in the next segment. And Headless, if you have any closing statements. Well, when it comes to buying games on release, last time I did that, we're going way back in time to kind of early, mid, uh, previous generation era. So we're talking like 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a Star Wars Rogue Squadron series, and the first game on Nintendo 64 was fantastic. Yes, Rogue I love that game. Rogue Leader came out on the GameCube, and it convinced me to buy the console. That's how much I, I fell in love with that game. So when there was going to be a third game announced, and the entire second game was going to be playable in two-player co-op, I didn't even think about it. I just laid down 50 bucks on the game, because there's no way that they could screw it up. And they did, epically. They had horrible third-person segments, the enemy AI was dumber than ever before, the whole game was really slow and really boring, and the co-op campaign for the previous game wasn't worth it. I'd rather just play the other game on my own. I don't have to worry about getting a co-op partner or anything like that. So after that, I decided I was never going to spend 50 bucks on a game again, and the only time I ever did spend more than 30, which is my limit, was to get Skyrim, which ultimately really disappointed me. I know a lot of people really love it. It just wasn't my thing. But developers and publishers really do understand money. That's you know that's a, a pretty strong motivation for them. You know they spend all this time and effort and money getting the game out there, and they'd like to see something in return. But when you go out and you steal a game, what they're seeing is they want to play the game. They just don't want to pay for it. So that's part of why we're seeing free-to-play models come up, and then they have to bend the game to make it work in a free-to-play setting. Take, for example, the new Age of Empires game, Age of Empires Online. AoE is a... Area of Effect? It is Area of Effect. Yes, yes, it is definitely Area of Effect. Yes! But Age of Empires is famous. There's no way around that. It's one of the most venerable real-time strategy series of all time. And they released a new game, and it, it didn't have anything to do, really, with the previous games. It didn't have anything that made them great. The whole game was shoehorned into this free-to-play model. And because it failed, and because there aren't many other real-time strategy games, the RTS genre has effectively died, and they're waiting for something vague to happen to bring it back, or they're just going to give it up. They'll they'll basically make up their own facts and then make them true. You know, it's their own self-fulfilling prophecy, as he said. Mm -hmm. uh, and developers that stand by the old ways, we're going to release a quality product. We aren't going to shoehorn in multiplayer. We're going to create original IP. We're going to try new things and do new experiments and see where we can take gaming. That was THQ. You know, the new Metro game wasn't going to have multiplayer in it because it just wouldn't work with the game. The game has staggeringly good graphics that can cripple great systems. Uh, they created Darksiders, original property. You know, it was a blend of kind of Legend of Zelda puzzle solving and God of War action. It was really great. They went on with the sequel and they had new ideas. They made it more kind of action RPG-ish. They had a new character with a different style of fighting. They did really great things with it. They, you know, they did do, they are doing, or were before they died, doing a sequel to Company of Heroes, but it wasn't the annual, now we're doing the third game, and the fourth game, and the fifth game. It came out, it's still in development, but it's coming out years later. Mm -hmm. They really kept a high standard of quality, and their reward for doing so was getting shut down. They tried to keep themselves alive with the uh, working with the Humble Bundle, and they ended up earning $5 million, and a good chunk of that, a very good chunk of that, was going to charity. And people still, you know, verbally abused them all across the internet. This is supposed to be sacred territory for indies, and I can agree with that and respect that, but, I mean, that's a lot of money for charity, and it's keeping one of the few great 
publishers, the few consumer-friendly great publishers alive. Frankly, you know, publishers and developers will go where the money is. That's why we see zombie games everywhere, because <laughs> yes. they make money. You know, you really do need to vote with your wallet and be very open and communicative with publishers. Otherwise, they won't see anything else. Exactly. Um, in order to end this, just because we've been staring at victory for a while, um, and we will definitely... It is a nice victory screen. <laughs> and uh, we will do a second part of this, guaranteed. Um, I want to thank again to One Hammer for bringing up this awesome subject, and I hope this video will be useful to you guys. But think about it this way, and this is yet another Total Biscuit thing. <laughs> uh, we are big fans of him here. Um, he... Uh, I don't remember if it's a quote directly from him or if it's a quote. I believe it's a quote that he quoted. Um, but so we're third generation. <laughs> we're third. We're we're triple quoting this. Um, but since it has quotations every time, it's not getting exaggerated. Um, but a, a man in the industry said that gamers need to look at buying a game as making a vote. Um, and you reminded me of it when you said vote with your wallet. Basically, when you buy a game for any amount of money. You are voting with your purchase that you want more games like that. Um, so when we decide to pull out our wallet or pull out our credit card or pull out our checkbook and purchase a game, make sure before you do that that you've done your research and you know that it's a good game um, or someone you trust or you've had your hands on it or something has shown you that because even if you buy it and then hate it later, especially if you're doing it digitally, you can't get your money back from that, and you can't go back and tell them, oh, I'll take back my purchase. They're going to see that as just a purchase. They're going to add that to the units they sold, and they're going to think that it's doing that much better. Um, and even though in voting, people might say, well, that doesn't matter. You know, one, one person's not going to matter. It doesn't make a difference. It does, because it's not like we have some purchase electoral college who can then be like, oh, well, this game didn't sell well, but it was actually the best. They're going to look at numbers, and that's just how it is. They're businesses. And even if the, the employees that are on the ground are really enjoying what they're doing and they're passionate about their game, there's a good chance that at the top, money's all they see. And that could be either from selfishness or just from being busy. So I want you guys to go forth with this information we've given you. Um, take it for what it is. We're not trying to change your opinions to make them match ours. We're just giving you our opinions and our view to help you um, further strengthen or or um, form your own opinions on this and just go out with the conscious mind that you as an individual are greatly affecting the industry and the PC industry especially um, since I'm assuming this being mainly League of Legends channel you're mostly PC players um, excuse me well I hope you guys are having a good day and that you're enjoying your time just have fun gaming but uh, make sure to game responsibly it's, again, this was a, this is me, Liquid Kitten. Alright, this is Headless97. And we will be back soon.